how wonderful it is to just love yourself just the way you are. And with that consciousness, I now introduce our speaker this morning, Reverend Michael Record, to bring you an inspirational message. Reverend Michael. Thank you, Vance. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Welcome, welcome again to this Sunday morning service at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica. As Van said, it really is a beautiful morning. I'm looking at the golden sunset. I'm looking at flowers of all colors. I'm looking at the green of the trees of the grass, and it's nice and cool. A lovely morning. Wish you all were here. But I hope that where you are is as pleasant. If there's anyone, I'm greeting, I'm greeting both those my online audience, sorry, and those who are worshiping in person in the sanctuary. And if there's anyone listening to the service for the first time, a very special welcome. We're gathered together in gratitude for the many blessings we continue to receive from our infinitely generous source, God. My talk today is about interpersonal relationships, and the title is a question helped anybody lately? I hope your answer is yes. Let me tell you four stories that you've heard before about people who helped other people, all strangers. I got the stories from the internet and I'll relate them to you in chronological order. Oldest first. Story number one. A man fell victim to robbers as he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw the victim, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who came upon him was moved with compassion at the pitiful sight. He poured oil and wine over the victim's wounds and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Story number two. The inner city communities of Arnett Gardens and Trenchtown in Kingston are hailing 24-year-old Tremaine Brown as a hero after he rescued a 12-year-old boy who was swept away by floodwaters in the community on Friday, September 8, 2017. Ronaldo Reynolds and his friends were playing in the gully in the vicinity of, the 7th, Ave of 7th Avenue while on their way home from school, when water with strong currents came rushing down. Reynolds got into difficulty and was soon swept away. Brown, who six months ago was deported from England, was working some meters down the road at the Boys Town Community Center when he heard residents raising an alarm on learning that a child was being washed away in the gully, 
Brown said he immediately jumped in and held on to the child. He suffered several cuts and bruises as the current pushed them toward the Maypen Cemetery, where Brown was able to hang on to a tree. Little Ronaldo still clutched in his arms. Brown said as he shouted and waited for help, at times he felt like giving up. The little boy started praying and I just held on to him until the, the residents came, said Brown, adding that the prayers gave him the strength to hold on. On Sunday morning, as Ronaldo, with his Bible in his hand, headed for church, he would meet up with Brown for the first time since the rescue. Brown, who was on his way from the barber, would get more praises for his heroic act. Ronaldo's mother, Karine Dugan, was also thankful. Of Brown, she declared, me would say, that man is next to God, unquote. Story number three. The Good Samaritan who gave tax affair to Olympic gold medalist Hans of Parchment in Japan, allowing him to secure his place in history at last month's Olympics, has been invited to Jamaica by the government. The woman who literally saved Parchment from missing the 110 meters hurdles event after he accidentally boarded a bus to the aquatic instead of the track and field stadium is now being tracked by the Ministry of Tourism. Minister Edmund Bartlett said, Parchment dedicated a three minute 27 second video saluting the woman, known only as Tijana, for her kindness. He said that had it not been for her selflessness, he probably would not have run in the historic race. When he realized he was on the wrong bus and tried to get assistance from the official cars at the Olympic event, they were all already booked. And his only option was to return to the Olympic Village and take another bus. However, that would have caused him not to be able to warm up for the run. I saw this volunteer and I had to beg, because of course she's not allowed to do much, said Parchment. And she actually gave me some money to take one of the taxes. And that's how I was able to get to the warm-up session and had enough time to compete said the Olympian, describing the incident as awesome. Parchment not only thanked the Good Samaritan publicly, but he paid back the money, you'll be glad to hear, that she had given him, and he gifted her a Jamaican shirt. After viewing the video, the tourism minister said, is selflessness what she did? One doesn't know what the outcome might have been otherwise. He said he was moved to invite the lady to Jamaica where she will be hosted by his ministry team. And story number four. 27-year-old Mervyn Kelly is being hailed as a hero in the community of Cave Valley in St. Anne after he rescued a male driver and a little girl from a car that was completely submerged on a flooded road in the town on August 27th, some 15 days ago. Heavy rains associated with tropical storm Ida caused the Cave River to overflow the banks, flooding Cave Valley and other communities in southwest St. Anne. Sometime after three o'clock that afternoon, Water from the river was rushing across a section of the road in Cave Valley when a white car being driven by a man with a child on board encountered the raging water. The driver stopped 
but soon after decided it was safe enough to drive through, and he proceeded. Almost instantly, the powerful gush got hold of the car and started twirling it, rapidly filling it with water. The vehicle was soon completely submerged. Him underestimate the water, Kelly, the rescuer, rescuer told the gleaner. A delight post and the tree stopped the car from wash wet. Kelly said he was in a supermarket nearby when he heard a commotion outside and ran to investigate. When Kelly reached the car, both occupants had made their way outside the vehicle. The frightened man was holding the little girl. Kelly took the child and struggled to safety through the rushing water as the man followed. Kelly said he didn't know the driver and didn't get a chance to get acquainted after the incident. Because the water did dirty, me just go home and wash off with some bleach water. Me no them, me no know them, them is not from this area, he said. And he continued, me put my life at risk, but what me fi do? If me see someone out there drown, you know some may go try to save them. Is a must. Those are just four of the countless stories about helping that you can find online. The first is, of course, the most famous. But in my opinion, the three Jamaican ones are just as powerful. By the way, just hearing stories of kindness is supposed to lift your happiness level. So how do you feel? Good? Oh, great. Good. It's natural for people to help people. By natural, I mean it is in our nature. It's a feature or characteristic of being human. Don't think, though, that means we can't ask why this is so. It's natural for apples to fall from trees, and they've been falling for as long as apple trees have been around. And for tens of thousands of years, people have been observing apples falling. But no one thought to ask why until Isaac Newton, about 500 years or so ago. And of course, his question led to the major scientific discovery of gravity. So for this talk, I want to discuss why people naturally help one another. Scientists give us one reason at least. It makes the helper feel good. And this because of the release of feel-good chemicals like endorphins, dopamine, and serotonin into the bloodstream. Some people take drugs or alcohol to feel good, but more health-conscious people help others and feel even gooder. Oh, in case you ever don't feel in the mood to help someone, eat some dark chocolate. Now there's a pleasant assignment. It's a mood booster, and studies show that just one ounce can elevate your happiness level for up to six hours. Oh, and this makes dark chocolate an excellent choice for a date night. Another reason people give help is they like being thanked. It's nice to be recognized and appreciated, isn't it? Sure. But there's something a little suspicious when the reason you help your neighbor is to get a reward. We feel that help should be unconditional. Another more fundamental reason for kindness, one that the helper doesn't even think about consciously, is that people helping people helps to ensure the continuity of the human race. Living things 
want to go on living even though they're dis even through their descendants so animals and plants the living things do their best to propagate the species and later i'll mention an even more fundamental reason but first i want to touch on something that is the opposite of helping Many people, either deliberately or inadvertently, stifle someone else's self-expression. Before meditating in the mornings, I read a treatment. For newcomers, a treatment is what we call scientific prayer, and I get my treatments from old Creative Thought magazines the late lamented creative thoughts. I really enjoyed that magazine. The epigraph for the treatment I read on Independence Day last month was by Ernest Holmes. And it stated, I quote, we have a right to unlimited health, prosperity, loving relationships, and creative self-expression, unquote. Dr. Holmes, who is the founder of our church and the conceptualizer of our teaching, Science of Mind, lists in that sentence the four fundamental desires and needs of every human being. Their health, abundance, satisfying relationships, and self-expression. So here's a question. Why are those desires and needs fundamental? First, let's look at health. You can't do much if you're sick. And when you are, your first concern is to get well. And then you can go on to self-express. And abundance, abundance is necessary if you're to create anything. Abundance of energy and power an abundance of substance to make things out of. For example, the potter needs clay to make pots. The dressmaker needs cloth material to make dresses. And what would life be without satisfying relationships? Everybody needs somebody sometime. Or to put it another, would, I would not, another way, Everybody needs somebody sometime. You know the song. Everybody wants to love and be loved. Now, I am positing that the last of the main desires for self-expression is as important as the desire for life. The latter is physical, and the former is spiritual. Everybody wants to be important, to do something important in life, and to leave, as the poet says, footprints on the sands of time. Now, as you know, instead of sand, some people leave their names on their desks at school. Harry was here. Perhaps you have seen those statements of existence. Perhaps you have written one yourself. Other people are more ambitious and express themselves in ways no one has ever done before. They run faster, they jump higher, they invent new things, and so on. So even if you have if you never find yourself in a position to actually save a life, like three men in the stories I just told, or to help an Olympian with tax affair, you will frequently be in a position to help someone express him or herself. Do so, and certainly never try to stifle their fundamental desires. I hope I'm not talking to anyone who does that, but just in case, quickly ask yourself, am I stifling anyone else's self-expression? 
You see, often it's not done with a bad intention. Sometimes, ironically, because they want to be helpful, some people habitually tell others what to do, where to go, and what to be. They might be quite ordinary people, like parents and policemen, husbands and wives, bosses and friends. I bet you have heard a parent saying something like, No, Billy, I want you to be a doctor, not a stand-up comedian. And here's a policeman. Today is no movement day. You are all under arrest for attending that birthday party. Unquote. And here's a wife. Paul, you are not going to church in that floral shirt. Wear this nice blue one instead and the striped tie. I could go on, but you get the idea. You want to do, to do something to express yourself, but somebody else wants you to do something else, often cramping your own heart's desires. And here I should remind you, Reverend Anne, Reverend Anne, Reverend Anne and Sonia are facilitating a class about how to fulfill your heart's desire on Thursday evenings. Now, different philosophers and psychologists will give you different answers as to why some people try to stifle others' self-expression. And their answers depend on their theories about what is the driving force for man's actions in life. Now, be warned, I'm about to drop some big names on you. Names you have probably heard, but may not remember what these persons taught. So here's a quick review. Sigmund Freud, I know you remember him. He believed that man's fundamental drive was to obtain pleasure, and that's quite often described as the sex drive. Viktor Frankl, believed that the primary drive in man was a search for meaning, a meaning to life. Friedrich Nietzsche and Alfred Adler felt that the, the desire for power over others was the main driving force. And Carl Jung taught that there was a twin drive, power and love. Rollo May, famous as the author of Man's Search for Himself and Love and Will, among other books, agreed with him on that point. Young declared, I quote, where love rules, there is no will to power, and where power predominates, there love is lacking. The one is the shadow of the other, unquote. The overarching aim in life, Jung said, was the fullest possible actualization of the self through individuation. He sounds a little bit, doesn't he, like Abraham Maslow with his theory of self-actualization. Now, as I return to the more positive topic of why people do help others, I come back to Dr. Holmes, to his theory on that subject. In his inspirational masterpiece, The Science of Mind, page 106, he writes, I quote, whatever is true of the universe as a whole must also be true of the individual as some part of the whole, unquote. For example, my example, what the ocean as a whole is made of, a cupful of the ocean must also be made of. If you agree with that logic, you will accept this other passage from Holmes's chapter. I quote, 
as effect must partake of the nature of its cause, so man must partake of the divine nature from which he springs. We did not create our nature. We cannot change its inherent reality. We are what we are, and we use this nature for better or worse." Unquote. And so I ask you, what is the nature of the I am which created the universe and us? We always say, don't we, God is love. So logically, we too are love. But what exactly does that mean, we are love? It means that we are loving creatures. And that basically means we are helping creatures. We say God is love because we believe God, through nature, supports us. So there you have it at last. The simple truth I've been holding from you for 15 minutes. The fundamental reason we help one another is because of our inherently divine godlike nature. We were made in God's image and likeness. Oh, I must tell you this before I go on to my final paragraph. Yesterday, just as I reached that spot in my talk, as I tried to polish it, the phone rang. It was Angela Elliott, our musical director. She told me the title of the song that Lilith Nelson will be treating us to in a moment. It was deliberately chosen to complement the theme of my talk about helping. When Angela told me, I felt such a surge of joy and gratitude to both ladies. They really are divine beings. What is Lilith's song going to be? If I can help somebody. So, here we come to the final paragraph. I would have ended the talk with the reminder that we are made in God's image and likeness, except that I suspect that some of you are asking a very reasonable question about the fundamental motivation of those unhelpful people I spoke of earlier. Why do some people, God's children as much as you and I, treat others from a basis of power rather than love, for instance? I turn again to Dr. Holmes for the answer. God, who is infinitely creative, had to give free will to at least one of the many life forms he created. Some of those life forms were made without that capacity. Free will, jellyfish, spiders, and coronaviruses, for example. But God, but man, God made with free will. And because people have choice to do what they want, some will inevitably choose to do harm, harming themselves and others. People do make mistakes, defined as things they later regret. Our job as religious scientists is to get those people to see that their true nature, like God's, is love and assure them that, because of God's grace, they can choose again. Namaste. <laughs>